Uh, you may remember about a year ago before I went to Korea some of the things we talked about. Anyone remember? No. No? You don't remember? We talked about um, essentially what you were made for. You remember that? What were you made for? Did anybody remember? You're made for good, right? It was good, it was good. Anybody remember that? No? God created you, it was good, and, and so there, we're on this journey back to good. Anybody recall that? The journey back to good? The journey back to good has a lot to do with, um, you know, going and accepting symbols and, and, and being willing to move yourself into the direction God would want you to go, right? Um, that was that was Moses' journey out of Egypt. Moses took us out of Egypt. Egypt was not good. If you, That's why he wrote Genesis. Egypt, Egypt was not a good place. But he wanted the people to remember what they were made for. They were made for good. Uh, all of us have had a journey that has probably not seemed all that great all the time, right? Am I wrong? Like, has your life just gone perfectly? Have you had such a wonderful journey that you just feel like you're so proud of every single one of your accomplishments? No, I mean, that's probably not the case for any of us, is it? Uh, certainly wasn't even the case for Moses. At the end of Moses' life, he didn't even get to accomplish what he had visioned um, accomplishing, which was to take them into the promised land. Now, of course, when they got to the promised land, it wasn't such a great promise, was it? Did, did it seem like it was flowing with milk and honey? No, there were, there were giants in the land. There were, there were enemies to fight in the land. Well, our lives are very similar, aren't they? You know, we have a constant struggle between, you know, wanting what God wants for us good and, and actually living in the reality, which doesn't always seem so good. But we do have to remember what we were made for. I think Galatians gives us a very good picture, a very good window into this. I want to set the stage for you a little bit. The Adventist church has had a, had a lifelong struggle in its entire history with legalism. Okay, I'm going to say that again. The Adventist church has had a lifelong struggle in its entire history with legalism. I hope that offends you. Because it offends me greatly. I became a Sunday Adventist in, in the 2002 when I was on a deployment with the military chaplain. Sit back, some of my friends are here, and they remember um, a little bit of my story and how I ended up in the brig and all that stuff. And and uh, you know, you guys are actually part of my my journey. So thank you so much for your family being here. Um, I, irony of ironies, we're now in the same place. And um, and actually, you're not in the Marine Corps, but I'm back in the military. How, how, how amazing is God? I, don't, I never would have envisioned, envisioned myself back in the military as a chaplain. So, you know, I know God has us on a journey towards good. I can, I can testify to that. The, the Adventist church has had a lifelong struggle with legalism. I hope that offends you. What that means is we need to take this topic of the relationship of the law and Christ very seriously. The struggle started like this. There were these old guard guys, that Uriah Smith and, and George Butler, right? And if you've ever heard of any of those historic Adventist fellows who, who were instrumental in, in establishing the core doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, right? Uh, and by the way, we're Christians. We are faith-oriented Christians, aren't we? I mean, we are not. We are Protestants. We may be the only people still protesting. We should be proud of that. But these guys, you know, they, they, they cared about the core doctrines, right? Sabbath, second coming, state of the dead, salvation. Salvation through the prism and the lens of the sanctuary. Our most unique doctrine is the sanctuary doctrine. Because we see a full-scale view of salvation. We don't just see a limited view of atonement. Does that make sense to you? Like our brothers and sisters in other, in other faith groups have a very narrow scope of what atonement actually means. And, and they reduce it to the cross. And, and yet Christ never reduced salvation to just the cross. He's had a plan from the foundation of the world, right? From the foundation even before the world began. He had a plan in place. And that plan is seen through the lens of the sanctuary. And so the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I'm so proud to be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Um, and, I, and I'm not Seventh-day Adventist-centric. Like, you would meet me on an average day and you'd think, is that guy really a Seventh-day Adventist? And the reason is, is because I didn't grow up in this community. 
So it's really hard for me to connect some of the traditions that we have. See, there is a difference between Adventist culture and Adventist doctrine. And we have to really understand how they work with each other. But the struggle of legalism has been since the foundation of our denomination. George Butler and Uriah Smith uh, arguing against these younger guys, uh, Jones and Wagner, who in 1888, if you've ever heard of the 1888, the big debacle in 1888, I won't bore you with that. We could, we could get in, down in the muck and mire over that because it's still actually going on today, some of that debate. Ellen White was essentially grieved by some of the things that were happening there. And, and essentially, I say this only to illustrate to you that the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church has struggled with legalism. The argument was this. The argument was essentially that the law needed to be upheld over everything. That the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, were so important. And folks, the reason why they wanted the Ten Commandments to be so centralized was because of that great Sabbath commandment, right? The, the Fourth Commandment. And the Fourth Commandment is so significant, I would, I would submit to you, not because of the Decalogue, but because of salvation and because of its connection to creation. Not because there's a law that says we should. In fact, there is not even a prescription of how to keep that law anywhere in Scripture. So we get into these arguments about what we should or shouldn't do on the Sabbath, and, and all of it is an is a exercise of futility because there isn't one prescri prescription. There are some prohibitions, but there is no real prescription on how you should maintain your Sabbath. So when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, one of the struggles I had was, how do I become a Sabbath keeper? What is that? Because on the average Sabbath, um, a lot of bad things would happen to me. Like I'd get in fights with the kids before we get them in the car. They wouldn't get ready in time. It was extremely stressful. Those of you who have families, you know that it's stressful to bring a family, a young family to church. And then when I was becoming an Adventist, I was like, there's all these things they eat that I've eaten before. And now all of a sudden, I, they have a problem with me eating this. I go to the grocery store and someone looks at my shopping cart and they judge me based on, like, there's not soy milk in the, in the cart, but they have soy milk in their cart. It's like... I made this this switch from a new from a new culture, but yet I, I had some sense of faith already, and so I was trying to blend the two together, and I was just found I just found out that it was it was a foundational problem of egos. That vegetarians are not saved over meteors. And that was hard for me. It was hard for me to understand for this reason. The community that I was in was a bit rigid. The community I was in was a bit rigid. It goes to show you how much culture impacts belief. And so I want to bring this subject to you for this reason. Because historically, Adventism has struggled with legal, legalism. And yet I'll tell you that not one place in any of our doctrine will you see legalism. That's, that's the craziest thing about this message that I want to talk to you about today is that if you look at our doctrine on Sabbath, second coming, state of the dead, salvation, all of those are grace oriented. Every single one of them are centered and rooted in what Christ did for us, not what we do for him. And yet the disconnect comes when the culture clashes with scripture. And we're supposed to be the people of the book and the people who actually reinvent traditions to be more in line with our faith. Which means we have to be highly bendable. And yet many of us are not. We're rigid and obtuse and demanding. So I want to do something here with you today. I need a couple of volunteers before I open up Galatians. I like children, not adults, because children are more fun to watch. And you have to have some stamina. Like, you're going to be up here a while. I, I promise you that. You're going to be up here a while. So I need three volunteers. And just come up to the front. The first three who come up here to the front. But remember, you have to have some stamina. So, looks like we're going to need one more. I think we got some older boys there. Uh, one of you all can come up here and help me out. That would be great. Especially you. I know you, man. You are, a, we're going to talk about what a disciplinarian is, and you are the epitome of a disciplinarian. So, yeah. I need you to come over here, okay, right here. I need you to come over here, okay, to stand here. Like, that's good. Now, I need you to hold this young man captive. I mean, I want, hold him captive, brother. Like, he's in your presence.
person. He's in bondage by you. Alright? Okay, so let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, open your word, open the word of God. To Galatians chapter 3, I'm going to use the ESV because I kind of like the way the translation is. You read the King James when you were doing the scripture reading. It's an okay translation too. One of the problems we have with the law of Galatians has a lot to do with the translation of Galatians chapter 3. So we're going to read Galatians chapter 3. It goes like this. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I mean, you got to love how Paul starts out there. Like, what's your problem? Now, Paul is dealing with some serious situations here when he says, what's your problem? Galatians, what's your problem? What he's dealing with is a group of people who are Judaizing Christians who do not want to accept that there are things about Judaism that do not have to carry over into this new movement of Christ. And he's really struggling to, to get the message to them. And sometimes Paul gets a little forceful. You, you may not know this, but Paul curses in Scripture. Yeah. So next time your children hear you curse, forget the coin jar. Just say, well, Paul does it, I can do it. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't curse in front of your children because they'll start cursing too. I promise you that. Paul is also trying to establish his own authority. When he begins the book of Galatians, he says, you all may not think this, but I'm an apostle. And what it means to be an apostle is a ministry and an office that does not continue after they die. It is special to them. Now we know it's special for Paul because he had that road, that experience, right, on the road to um, Emmaus. Do you remember that? That experience he had? And so when Paul had this conversion, he, he knew that this was a dramatic calling that God had given him, and he's getting an authority that wasn't given to anyone else in his sphere of influence in his class, but yet there were these disciples who had already been called prior to Christ even ascending. So he had to over and over and over again reestablish his authority and credibility. And yet Paul is the most prolific writer of the New Testament, isn't he? Isn't that amazing? Now we, we can relate to that, can't we? Based on the fact that we have a few writings in our church too. Somebody who is really the least of everyone becomes a powerful tool for God. And that's what Galatians is doing. As Paul is opening up here saying, my gift or my office of an apostle was given not by man, it was given by Christ himself. Now that is a bold claim. But what it does is if it's true, and the things that you're saying, you know the test of a prophet, that if they say anything that's not you know in the word, if they say anything that's against what's already written, well, then we have some problems, and we should cast them away and they're of nothing, right? In the book of Isaiah, you can read that test. But what we have happening here in, in Galatia is him establishing his authority, and as he establishes authority, um, they, are, they are testing him, and he is also challenging the limits of grace in the community. Because the community is not very grace-oriented. And they believe in keeping ceremonies, they even believe in the Jewish um, civil law, the ceremonial law, and the death law. So they have these three components of the law that they want to lift up and keep going in the movement of Christ. Now you can see some problems, can't you? How is it that a new movement of Christ, not tied to Jew or Gentile, not tied to a nation, has to keep the civil laws of Israel? First of all, there is no Israel. Let's just be honest about what is happening in the day in the first century. There's Rome, there is no Israel. We can try to pretend that Israel has some kind of authority, but they couldn't even put Jesus to death without the Roman authority. Right? In fact, at, at the cross, uh, or at the, at the Pilate's uh, you know, little uh, um, grand jury, his little judgment session, they say to them, we have no king but Caesar. They essentially submit themselves to the Roman authority. There is no such thing as Jewish civil law. So why are these Galatians trying to lift up the Jewish civil law? Why? Because they're so tied to their culture. And then the ceremonial law. And as you become a, a Christian, you start to realize that all of the things that were ceremonial were fulfilled in Christ, right? So all of these feast days and all the things that were important, circumcision, all of this, all of that, Jesus kind of redefines, doesn't he? I mean, Christ gives us the, the, the 
um, admonishment that we should essentially allow God to live in our hearts, that we don't have this external um, mandate to circumcise, amongst other things. <clears throat> so Paul is establishing his authority. You're not holding him in bondage very much. I mean, I think you need to put him in prison. Give this guy some, some understanding that he is captive. All right? I, I don't think he'll mind. I think he'll let you hold him captive. Like, wrap your arms around the dude. There you go. Now he's in bondage. There we go. So, Paul wants to set people free from the bondage of the law. He wants to make a community that has its DNA rooted in legalism and help them to understand the functionality of the law. But what Paul does not want to do is do away with the law. So we have to establish that in the onset. When we're reading Galatians, he establishes authority, he says, I'm an apostle that was given to me by Christ himself. Now why did Christ give him an office in general? Why? Because there's a rule. There's a law. There's a reason why Christ could establish an office in his church. So Paul, so Paul is not trying to say that God is not a God of order. God is not a God of, of, of substance to the point in which he would hold people accountable. That, let's not come to that stance. We would call that antinomianism, which is against the law. And Paul is not against the law. Is Christ against the law? No, it was Christ who gave us this law, right? So we have to keep that in the forefront, and Paul wants us to understand that. But when Paul says in chapter 3, what's your problem? You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has sold you a bill of goods? Why are you so confused? Let me ask you only this. So there are a, there's a question Paul's going to establish. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? Or by hearing with faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Say that again. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? That's like saying everything that has come so far has only come from the Spirit of God. How come now you think it's going to happen by the flesh? Why all of a sudden do you think it's going to happen by the flesh? When everything you have seen in front of you so far has been God's work for you, why all of a sudden do you think that it's going to be your work for God? Do you, do you get that point? I mean, Christ came. He was crucified. He died. He taught us how to be disciples. He did all these things. And yet now all of a sudden you think the tables are turned. And everything else is going to happen by your own works. It does not fit within the theme of Christ's ministry. And so that is his first argument to them. So who has told you these things? Who has bewitched you? Who has sold you a bill, bill of goods? Now Paul knows the answer to this, and so do you. The Jewish system. The pharisaical system. The legalistic system. So in other words, the early church had the same struggle that Adventism has. Their DNA was legalistic. In that case, we're not special. I think all of humanity struggles with legalism. And the reason is, is we like to be recognized for the things that we do. We love to be lifted up and given higher social status, put on a big, on a, on a, on a, a greater plane than everyone else. We, we thrive on it. We live on it. We, we live on success even. If you ever been to a high school reunion, you know this. Like, I didn't go to my 20 year high school reunion because it's like, I, I, the 10 year high school reunion, all I did was hear about all the great accomplishments that everybody had. And then the people who had become nothing, like guys still working in the tire shop in the same town that we grew up in, was, you know, looked at as if he was inferior to everybody else. And so it was a turnoff to me. But for many people, they had their moment of glory, right? And that is just the way humanity works, unfortunately. So it's in our DNA. It isn't just the early church. It isn't just Adventism. It's humanity in general. Works-based salvation is in our DNA. And we have to constantly guard against it. 
So Paul wants to establish this with us. So he says, are you so foolish? Having begun the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? Indeed, it is in vain. <clears throat> Does he who supplied the spirit to you and works miracles among you uh, do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed, God and believed in God, it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, before you're thinking that belief is the most important thing here, let's let's establish a couple things. Abraham might have believed on the onset initially. We talked about this the last time I was with you. But Abraham did not act upon his belief very well. Right? He, he believed, but then the very next thing he says in Genesis 15, he says, Okay, God, I believe, but what will you show me so I can continue to believe? And so God puts him in deep sleep, you know, the small fire pot, I've told you this story before. And so essentially, he wakes up, and he goes out and has a whole another family with a woman that God had not envisioned him to have a family with. And so now we get an entire offshoot movement of a religion that still exists to this day. All because Abraham didn't really exercise belief very well. So there's always a disconnect, isn't there, in humanity in what we believe and what we practice? We really need to guard ourselves against that because many times what we actually profess, we, we don't really do. Right? So who is the object of belief here? Let's continue to read. It says, so now that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, and the scripture, foreseeing that God, who was justified by Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. In other words, we're all like Abraham. So if you think you can rely on your own belief to make this happen, you have a bit of a problem with your faith because Abraham wasn't even able to do that. So then how can we do it as well? Right? So if Abraham was not justified by his faith, but was justified by essentially an external source of faith, we have to also keep that in mind that our justification cannot come by the acting out of our faith into some kind of external manifestation of works. It's a very poignant point that Paul makes, although it can be confusing. Because he's setting up a couple questions here. What Paul wants us to see is that there are these three questions that are essentially important when it comes to faith. The first question being, who has bewitched you? Which is a great starting point. What's your problem, in other words? Did you receive the Spirit by obeying the law or by believing what you've heard? So that's question number one. Did you receive Did you receive this Spirit by obeying the law or by believing what you heard? Alright, that's question number one. Question number two in Galatians is, what then was opposed to the promise of God? What then was opposed to God's law and the purpose of God's law? And question three is, is the law opposed to the promises of God? Is the law opposed to the promises of God? What do you think? Is the law, is the law opposed to the promises of God? Why not? Well, everything on this podium is going to fall down on me, if you can believe that. I think I'm going to fix this podium for you all. I'm going to put a little, like, chunk of wood there so, like, if somebody has something here, it doesn't fall down. How many times have you watched somebody over the course of your time here drop stuff off of this podium? All the time, right? Well, it may not be works oriented salvation, but I'm going to fix that for you. None of you got me laugh, guys. Come on, like, relax a little bit. It's going to be okay. It's, I promise you it's going to be okay. Now my tablet is turned off and all kinds of stuff. And so all because that stuff is going to fall off the podium. And now you're distracted and you're like, what the heck is this guy talking about? And, and now we're in trouble. And now my slideshow is restarting. So you're still holding him in bondage. I see that. Now you don't even know what your role is yet, right? But you're about to figure it out, I promise you. <clears throat> so let's not skip over these three questions that Paul presents in Galatians. First question being, um, who has bewitched you? What's your problem? Why is it that you think that your faith doesn't come from the Spirit? Why do you think it comes from your own works? Question number two, was the law's purpose? What was the law's purpose? And 
Maybe you should think about finding it out. So what is the law's purpose? Question number two. Question number three, is the law opposed to the promises of God? So Paul is a little bit intense when he presents this to the church. You know, maybe even a little abusive, you might say. Because now we get to Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, which is the point of what we're talking about here. And it says, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So, you are the law. He's a good lawman, isn't he? And you, my friend, are just an innocent bystander. An average sinner. Are you okay with that? Okay. Now, your role will come soon. So then the law was our guardian. Now, the translation of this word, it, it's, it's pedagogos, right? Pedagogos is where we get the word in English, teacher. Um, um, pedagogy or um, teachings or instructions. And the word pedagogos is a big word, but it does not mean schoolmaster. And it does not mean, um, I don't know, guardian. It doesn't mean um, teacher. It doesn't mean any of those things. It's a very specific function. It was a, a, a Greek slave who, was a, who worked for a person of nobility. So they were kind of like an elevated slave. And that person would be in charge of young men until they were about age 16 or so. And what they would do is they would make sure that your young boy didn't get in trouble. You know, they wouldn't really teach them other things other than like street smarts kind of thing. They weren't like their educators, <clears throat> but they were more like a drill instructor, a drill sergeant, to make sure this kid learns what discipline is, to make sure he learns about how to do the right things in life, to make sure he has an understanding of Greek culture, and that he doesn't get in trouble while his noble owner is out, you know, making the, making the dough, right? And so, he had such authority, you had such authority as a pedagogos, or as a ped pedagogy, or a, essentially disciplinarian, I think would be the better word, a disciplinarian. He had such authority that let's say the young man got in a fight with somebody, it really didn't even matter whose fault it was, but because this is a noble kid, the other kids were the ones who were going to be punished. And you would have the authority, there's a story about this in, in history, about a man named Clericles, who was essentially able to take his young, um, you know, protege, and he, the altercation that he was in with uh, some boys, he took the boys to the local magistrate, and the orders were to have him executed in public. And then this happened. And so you had a lot of authority as a disciplinarian. So our lawman here is what Paul is talking about. Paul is saying that the law had that kind of authority over us. Not only to keep us in check, but to even end us if it wanted to end us. I mean, the law is pretty intense in that role that Paul is talking about. And so as it goes on in verse 25, it says, but now, and I love that word that Paul uses, but now, because it means now there's something better than that, right? So, but now, that faith has come, now that faith has come. I, I don't miss this point, okay? Now that faith has come, is not talking about your belief. So if I say, Abraham, when I started out in Galatians, Abraham was a man of faith and was credited to him as righteousness. Was the emphasis on the accreditation of righteousness or on his belief? The accreditation of righteousness, right? And so now Paul makes this very related argument that faith is like a personal pronoun. Belongs to someone. But now that faith has come is it because your belief has come upon you? Let's keep reading. We are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. So what, what Paul is establishing here is a passive idea of faith, that faith is essentially Christ himself. That it is faith that has come. Faith in, how did the faith come? The faith came because Christ came. You, you see what I'm saying? It isn't because your belief all of a sudden manifested upon you. It's because Christ came, 
And Christ is the object of faith. Christ is faith itself. And so therefore, the accreditation of righteousness comes from the faith or the faithfulness of who? Of Christ. So the faithfulness of Christ is what brings the accreditation of righteousness, not your personal belief. This is a passive view of righteousness. Now, now Paul gets this from Habakkuk 2. The just shall live by faith. There are two components of righteousness by faith in Habakkuk, also, also mentioned in Hebrews chapter 10. And that is that, yes, I believe, and because I believe, you know, I, I have the, the benefit of doing the right thing because I believe. Now, not always. We learn that through human history that I can believe in something and do something totally opposite, right? But then there's this passive element of faith that the one who is faithful is not going, he is not going to be the one like over here who is essentially kind of a double-minded faith. Occasionally does what is right, but then also makes a lot of mistakes. Because the one that is faithful is fulfilling some essential promises. Okay? And those essential promises cannot be fulfilled by anyone else. In other words, what Paul is saying is this. Let the lawmen, let the lawmen, step this way, let the lawmen lead you to Christ. Okay? Let the lawmen lead you to Christ. Now stay here and keep them in bondage. <laughs> so in other words, what Paul is saying, let the law lead you to Christ. Let the law lead you to Christ. The law is important. With its whippings, it chases us. That's what Paul, that's what uh, Luther said, who was a Pauline scholar. Luther said this, he said, the law with its whippings leads us to Christ. So there's a function of the law, right? It is a schoolmaster, it's a disciplinarian, it's an authoritarian, it's someone who, it's a drill instructor. How, you had a drill instructor. Do you still remember what the drill instructor taught you? Do you still remember, like, standing there? I remember I had to set up the mini grinder. You have to set up the mini grinder? So the mini grinder was this thing, you take the barracks, and you move all of the beds over, and you set up all the foot lockers, and you start doing a drill inside the squad bed. <clears throat> well, if you mess up a drill, the drill instructor is right there to tell you that you're doing something wrong in a very nice way, right? No, not so much. Like by tipping things over, by throwing foot lockers around, by, you know, sometimes people got heart punched, you know, all kinds of stuff would happen, right? I remember this one time, there was a, we set up the mini grinder, and there's all these foot lockers, and our drill instructor was about this tall. And so he liked to elevate himself a little bit, so he's walking on top of those foot lockers, like this, as we're drilling in the middle. Well, somebody had missed a foot locker. And he fell. And you can imagine there were some giggles, right? I never saw things get so thrashed in my entire life. The racks were getting turned over. Everything in the, in the foot lockers were getting dumped out. Everything was moved into the center of the room. And then we had like a minute to get it all back in order. You remember those days? So that's what a drill instructor would do. The law is intense. Right? How many of you have ever felt really good about breaking the law? Right? Unless you don't get caught. Because yeah. I drove like 80 here this morning on 375. And what is it, like a 60 mile an hour, 65 mile an hour? 65, that's normal. Yeah. Right. And so, honestly, because I didn't get caught, I felt pretty good about it. <laughs> but if the law is there to find me, stand by, right? That does not feel so great. You know how embarrassing it is when you get caught. You know how shameful it is when you get caught. You know what kind of intense emotions are coming to you when you get busted. And imagine Christ over here, the one who never breaks the law, perfect in all of his righteousness, and you got to look at him with the law holding you bondage. He's over there. I'll never be like him. But yet there he is. The perfect law, not only the perfect law keeper, but the perfect law giver, right? The one who establishes his righteousness and his authority in all the world stands as an object lesson of who we should be and what we should become. It can be a little intimidating, can it? Imagine you're looking at beautiful Christ, who now has a white dress. 
and you have to live up to that. So you can imagine why Paul says to them, what is your problem? Why would you believe such a silly thing? Why don't you believe that the law is there to lead you to Christ? Why would you see the law in a place that it never should be? Who has bewitched you? I mean, who has fooled you and duped you into thinking that this guy is the object of your faith? Is the promise of God, okay? Now, this is so important for this reason. My kids, they love to ask me for things. Dad, can you do this? Dad, can you do that, right? Sometimes I commit to things. So imagine, like, I promise them I'm going to get them ice cream tonight. Which is a great thing. Everyone loves ice cream. But then, instead of getting them ice cream, I get them tacos. Tacos aren't a bad thing, are they? Like, in El Paso, tacos are pretty great. But they're not ice cream. And they're also not what I promise. Did God promise us the law? Or did he promise us salvation? So we can't have a bait and switch. The, the promises could never be fulfilled by something that were not actually promised. They have to be fulfilled by what was actually promised. Christ was promised, not the law. Do you see my point? Okay, so who has bewitched you? Who has fooled you? Now we've got to go back to Galatians chapter 3. And we've got to read a little bit more. We're going to look at verse 10. Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm still fighting the science thing here. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written. Now, I mean, I don't think you can get more plain than that. All who rely on the law are under a curse. Um, so, Paul said it. For it is written, curse is everyone who does not abide by the things that are written in the book of the law and do them. In other words, God, if he's going to hold you accountable to the law, he is a perfect officiator of the law. He is a perfect lawman. You will not escape the consequences of the law. It's not possible. Because the law is a curse if you break it. So now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Folks, the law is not of faith. Now I'm going to skip a little bit to the book of Hebrews, okay? Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 says this. In verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 10, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered here, make perfect those who draw near. Now, I think this is an extremely important point, who I think Paul also makes in Hebrews. And this is the point. There may be good elements of the law, there are a shadow of things that are good, part of the journey towards good. But they can never be the sacrifices of God. They can never stand as a sacrifice of God for you. And on top of that, it was never promised that you would get the law. In fact, otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshippers have once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin if the law was what brought atonement. Right? So the point is, the point being this: the law is not the promise of God. The law is not the promise of God. The law is there to lead us to Christ. So for us, when we struggle with legalism in our DNA, keeping that in its perspective of what the functionality of the law is, is paramount. Let the law lead you to Christ. Let the law lead you to Christ. Let the law show you your, in, in, your inefficiencies. In fact, the law was given at Sinai because they were lawbreakers. And so they needed to see a clear image of who they were. The law has its function. It shows us our need for Christ. It is there for that purpose and that purpose only. Now, that doesn't mean we don't want to do what it says. But we have to keep it in the proper perspective. And so when we look at Hebrews chapter 10... In verse 1 it says, For since the law has been a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it is just a symbol, it is just a type, it is just a shadow, Christ being the fulfillment, that in, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. 
<laughs> in other words, uh, there is no law that can make you perfect. And that is also to include the keeping of said law cannot make you perfect. Because our issue with sin is far deeper than what you do or don't do. There is a condition. There is a, a, a bent. There, uh, it's what in, in, in Genesis, God had to intervene and restore some semblance of, of, of the ability to choose when he gave, the, gave us enmity. When we can see something more clearly. Because what sin does is it enmeshes the relationship between good and evil. And so sometimes we're doing good and we think we're, we're doing the right thing when we're actually doing the wrong thing. And sometimes we're doing wrong when in actuality we may be doing the right thing. How many of you have the most confusing view of what's right and wrong? Sometimes I do something for my kids and I think it was the best thing I could have ever done with them. And then a year later the consequence of it is, you know, they're, they're, they're not appreciative or, they're, or they take me for granted or, 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 or maybe um, it led them to get poor grades because I decided to buy an Xbox or whatever. So the law and us have a very enmeshed, dysfunctional relationship. And even when man sinned, when God said that man had become like us, knowing good and evil, and you read the context of that, what he essentially meant was, man had become aware that they no longer have the ability and no longer have the correct understanding of the lines between good and evil. That they're so blurred that unless we get involved in the human condition, there is no hope for a restoration of good. And therefore, Philippians 2, God says that not counting anything of his equality in the Godhead, decided to volunteer himself and become one of us, to become a man. So that the law could lead us to his righteousness. So that the law could lead us to Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. Folks, what I'm saying to you is the problem we have with legalism is overcome by letting the law lead us to Christ. Let the law lead you to Christ is the object here. Hebrews chapter 10, as it goes on, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, um, actually it says here, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which will be greatly rewarded, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Now, was it the law that was promised? Or was it Christ and salvation that was promised? It was Christ, right? And it goes on to say, for a little while, the coming will come and will not be delayed. Now, I, I want to emphasize this point, because you have probably heard it said many times. But, it, but by the way, it goes on to say, but my righteous one will live by faith and he won't shrink back and he won't give up. So we are those who don't shrink back. And Paul has great confidence in us that we won't give up on Christ as the fulfillment of the promise. However, he who comes will come and will not delay. He who comes will come and will not delay. So essentially what that means, folks, is that Christ is coming when he's coming. He's not coming because you did something to make him come. Right? So if you read something out of context, and it says, uh, unless the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in uh, his church, then he won't come. Could it be true, or could it be that we're just taking that out of context? Because when the scripture says, he who comes will come and will not delay, it means that David can't play the guitar so well that Christ is going to break the eastern sky and descend and come here right here in the Northeast Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because he was such a great guitar player. Do you get my point? But yet David still should try to be a good guitar player. Because it does edify Christ. And it does bring honor and glory to Christ. But it will not create his second coming. The law shall lead us to Christ. There's a word here used in Galatians. Is the law the promise of God? Galatians chapter 3. Is the law the promise of God? And this is where Paul uses a curse word. The 
first word is, I can say it in Greek because it doesn't translate to English as a first word. But the first word is, Meganeto. It's like saying, H-E double hockey sticks, no. Right? It's emphasized. No way. Not ever. So if you ever hear somebody come up into the pulpit and say, that unless we become this perfectly obedient church and perfectly obedient people, unless we all become like Daniel without sin or flaw or Enoch and, and can walk side by side with God as if we're on the same level playing with him, you should run from that message. Because I, I think we have a duty and a responsibility. Irony of irony is using words like duty. That kind of perversion of the gospel. Here we are. Legalists live very differently than people who are grace oriented. Now I'm not talking about cheap grace. That, get that word cheap grace. There's no such thing as cheap grace. The sacrifice of Christ is so expensive and so great that the law itself could never, never be a perfect representation of how great the gift of Christ actually is. And so it's not cheap to look at Christ and to think my life could never measure up, that the mistakes that I've made could never measure up to how great of a sacrifice this is. So it's not cheap. When Jesus says in the book of Hebrews, he lives to intercede, he will forever live to intercede for us, but we want to rob him of his, of his ministry of intercession by thinking we don't need the advocate for forgiveness. It is a perversion and it is in our DNA and we have to be careful that we let the law lead us to Christ, not let the law lead us to the law. Let the law lead you to Christ. Following the law of Christ is probably the most essential function of the law you could ever lift up. The Ten Commandments came about at a point in time. Let's not forget they came about at a point in time at Sinai. They were given and when they were given, they were also broken, both literally and figuratively. And God, in His grace, did not turn Himself away from the people Amen. at Sinai. So we live in an imperfect world. We don't have even perfect laws. So we can say the Decalogue is perfect. We can say the Ten Commandments are perfect. But they are insufficient. Now you're probably ready to kill me for saying that. How are they insufficient? Well, I don't know about you, but I didn't wake up this morning thinking about how I was going to steal something from somebody. Did you? I didn't wake up this morning thinking about I was going to give a false testimony in court. I didn't wake up this morning thinking that I was going to, um, you know, uh, kill my brother, my sister. I certainly haven't taken the name of, the, of God in vain in the literal sense. The Ten Commandments are easy, folks. They're, they're, there's, I mean, the average Ten Commandment is not broken on a daily basis. But when you start looking at the, the, the real uh, principles and values behind the law, I submit to you is, is love. And even Jesus reduces this, right? Love your neighbor as yourself and love God with all your heart. The sum total of law and prophets is this, that you can do good unto others. Let's go beyond. So the law is easy. Civil law is certainly flawed and imperfect. If there was a law that could bring about the righteousness of Christ, don't you think it would have happened by now? If there's a law that can bring about your righteousness, don't you think it would have happened by now? We have so many laws, we create new laws every single day, and we create even rules in the church that we should or should not follow. Some of them have a lot to do with 
sexuality, who can or cannot talk about the gospel. So God enforces his law. And if he were to enforce Let the law lead them to Christ. Lead them to Christ. This faith is not for those who lead in salvation by works, it is for those who let the law to Christ. And this faith is not for those who trust in the law as a fulfillment of God's redemptive promise, it is unequivocally and indispensably for those who let the law lead them to to Christ. Christ is the fulfillment and the only fulfillment of God's law. Christ. Christ is the only fulfillment of God's law. This is a Samaritan. I'm sorry. I don't want to abuse him on the stage here, but the Bible. His function, his functionality is accomplished by giving over the child the, the, the young man who he was in charge of as a disciplinarian, giving him over to Christ. His function is accomplished. His function was to make him aware and clear that if you only have me, you will only be in prison forever. I don't know how much more clear Paul could be that the law keeps us in bondage until Christ comes, but now we're no longer in bondage. Are you going to forget your bondage? He held you there a long time. Will you ever forget being held there a long time in bondage? You'll probably remember that long after this sermon, don't you think? That you remember him holding you there and me forcing him to hold you there and him not wanting to do it because he doesn't want to be rough. But you will always remember being in bondage. How many of you have forgotten about your bondage? I have not forgotten about my bondage. I don't emphasize my bondage because I don't think the law or sin deserves that much attention. But Christ does for everything he's done for me. And so my relationship with Christ I will never forget what he freed me from. I will never forget the lessons of the law. But I don't want to live under that bondage anymore. How about you? I want to let the law lead me first. You guys can go sit down. Hey, give a round of applause. They're, they're probably like, what is this guy talking about? This faith is not for those who place tradition above those things. In other words, we have to reinvent our traditions. If our traditions and our culture give people outside the view that we're legalistic, folks, by all means, let's change them. Let's change them. It's, it's a cognitive decision. God gave us a brain so we could change it. Our mind so we could change it, right? We can change it as much as we want based on the information that we have and we make good, reasonable decisions. And a reasonable decision is not to say that Christ is going to come from my obedience. It's about the most unreasonable thing I've ever heard in a seven-day Adventist church. And I love being a seven-day Adventist. I love the Sabbath, the second coming, the state of the dead, the salvation prism that we see through the lens of the sanctuary. But I do not enjoy legalism because it robs me of my faith in Christ. <laughs> Paul's use of, is very intentional. That pedagogy, also that pedagogy, I don't know why we want to keep him around, but we do. Maybe because he protected us. 
practice for so long. You know, you become institutionalized in prison, don't you? There's a certain safety in keeping the law. Don't get me wrong, there's a, there's a safety in it. We, we, we need to have guardrails, we need to have limits. I'm not saying that. But then we become dependent on it. And our character is not formed. And we don't understand the depths of which Christ went to for us. And if I could illustrate this any more to you, any more clearly, by just saying, let the law lead you to Christ, I would. I don't know what else to say about the scripture in this case. I've heard a lot of fancy sermons about the law. I've heard a lot of reasoning me, people re trying to reason me back into the bondage of the law. How do we guard ourselves against that? How do we guard ourselves against thinking that if I don't do this, I won't be good enough to be with Christ? And there's a problem that we have. The problem that we have is that we love our traditions and our culture more than we love Christ. An example of this in the book of Hebrews is when they all want to go back to the sanctuary, to the sites of the sounds of the sanctuary, to the, the sacrifices, to the, um, you know, the priesthood. And Paul says to them that it's obsolete and passing away, but yet it's still there, still present, and it draws us in. It, it, it fools us. And I know when I was a Lutheran, I grew up as a Lutheran. I really love communion. I love looking at the the um, pastor who was essentially like a priest in Lutheranism, but pastor and his white robe and his sash and the way they would treat the emblems and like the songs they would sing and the, and the things they would recite very much like Roman Catholicism. If you've ever been to a high worship like that, there's something captivating about it. There's something that makes you feel like you're connected to something bigger than yourself. And I, I would submit to you that it's, it's a false feeling. None of us feel like good Christians. Do you feel like a good Christian? And yet the idea of righteousness by faith in both Galatians and Hebrews and Habakkuk too, the idea of righteousness by faith is essentially to move us from bondage, move us out of bondage, and then move us into the presence of Christ. And by being in the presence of Christ, we see His righteousness, not just as an object lesson of how we should or we could become, but His vision for us. What He would want for us. But the way most of us will look at that will be like the blending of the two. Yes, I want to be in the presence of Christ, but I'm not ready to be free from the bondage of legalism. The law does not forgive us of our sins, and yet we, we won't let ourselves be free from the prison so that we can be totally forgiven and totally in the presence of Christ. And I have to submit to you that I don't know how to help us with that. I wish I did. I think Revelation 12 helps out a little bit. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters, he who, who accuses them before our God, day and night, has been hurled down. Right? That's Satan, that's the, the, the fallen angels. They triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury. 
because he knows his time is short. What keeps us from the presence of Christ is the enemy. The one who has been pulled down. The one in which God said, you should, you should be fearful of this. You should have woe over this. Woe to you, the inhabitants of the earth. And how are they, how are they overcome? They overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Here is what leads to the word of your testimony. And I think if there's anything we could do to combat legalism, anything at all we could do to combat legalism, it would be to not be afraid of the enemy. To not be afraid of what Christ has done for us. We are so afraid that we are going to take advantage of Christ, that I sin and I have a besetting sin and it continues to go on and on and I can't free myself from it. We are so afraid because that besetting sin makes us feel like, like we're separated from Christ in such a way that he'll never accept us, that we keep ourselves in bondage instead of having the opposite view, which would be our testimony is based on the blood of the Lamb, not based on what I've done to accomplish this. And so I can trust coming to the blood of the Lamb, and then I won't be fearful anymore of the enemy. In fact, I may have such courage that I'd even be willing to go to death like Christ went to death. The courage that it gives you is not that you're going to die for salvation, but that you're not, you don't look at your life as, as such a token to yourself, or such a, a, a monument to yourself, that you wouldn't give it up for someone else or for Christ. I think the martyrs had this view. I'm not telling us to go up and become martyrs, but we love our lives so much. We love our lives so much. It goes back to wanting to lift ourselves up, right? Wanting to show our accomplishments. We love our lives so much that we're, we aren't willing to divest ourselves of those things and be willing to even go to death. For what Christ has done for us. And the enemy is death. For sure. The enemy has been thrown down here. The enemy has been hurled down here. And yet the only way to overcome the enemy is through the word of our testimony. And our testimony has to be. It has to be. That Christ freed us from the bondage of the enemy. That Christ freed us from the accusations of the enemy, using the law against us. And then when we're free, we'll see Christ and we'll understand his presence in such a way that our besetting sins, that our mistakes, that all the things that would keep them from us, we would understand that he's not fearful of sin in his presence anymore because of Christ. We are sin. We are corrupt. I don't know that we should tell children that, though. I don't know that we should have children up and show the story and tell them that, that you are nothing without Christ. Probably giving them a little bit of a self-confidence problem. But it is an ontological reality that we are in and of ourselves. We are an aberration from what God had intended us to be. And so in order for us not to end up back in prison, we must continue to let the law lead us to Christ or we're going back to bondage. When it comes to the law teaching us and leading us to Christ, the student can never surpass the teacher. Christ will always be above us. Letting the law lead us to Christ is a continual process that we cannot, we cannot give up on. Letting the law lead us to Christ is a trajectory towards eternity. It is, it is not here and now, but it is a trajectory towards eternity when one day we will be really free from bondage. Those who claim the, the promise of righteousness by faith will let the law lead them to Christ. Those who do not let the law lead them to Christ will continue to remain under the curse of the disciplinarian. And that is the hard, cold truth about the gospel, is if we want to be in prison, God will let us stay in prison. If we want to stay in prison, He will let us stay in prison. So if we want to avoid the discipline and the condemnation of the law, we have to let the law just simply lead us to Christ. The law functions to lead us to Christ. So in conclusion this week, when you are buying your soy milk, and you're eating your lentils, 
Please understand that salvation does not come from abstaining from cheese. Can you, can you just do me that one favor? Or even when you go to church next Sabbath, remember that your Sabbath keeping is not what saves you. Let the law lead you to Christ. And, and, and don't become so arrogant in your obedience, because I know you want to be obedient, I want to be obedient too, but don't become so arrogant in your obedience that you forget that the law is actually the law of love, not the law of, of, some, of some obscure rules. The law is the law of love. God wants us to, to have the freedom of love. And so then we can understand what it's like for Christ to fulfill his promise, for Christ to give us what he said he would give us. Don't, don't make the law the fulfillment of God's promise. The law is not the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation. Only Christ is the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation. So show someone this week. Show someone in your daily interactions. You know, that you can understand where they are. That you can see their position in life. And that you can see that there are ways to help free them from that bondage too. By even sharing your personal story, your testimony on how, how God used the law to lead you to Christ. That you're no longer in its condemnation or in its bondage. It's a ruthless schoolmaster. It's a ruthless disciplinarian. And there's something better than it. And it's Christ. Christ is the only fulfillment of this promise of salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we leave here today, we're leaving, going in your righteousness on our behalf. Your faithfulness on our behalf. We believe because you made it possible for us to believe. And our faith is not the object of the promise, but what you've done to be faithful to us. Let us worship you for this. Lord, we pray that we can submit our lives to you and trust you and trust in your word and in your blood, that it frees us from the bondage of the law. But Lord, help us not to be disobedient. Help us not to forget that the function of the law is to show us the right way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Well, um, it was a pleasure to be with you. Um, I, uh, I hope that uh, as you leave here today, and as we sing the closing song, that you will, will live in the grace of our God.